Good morning. We have a lot of people that are sick. We have a lot of people still out of town. But I want you to look around and the people who you notice that are not here today, I want you to pray for them. I want you to call them sometime this week and uh, let them know you missed them and let them know you care. And we have finished a year together, me and my family being a part of your family. And it's been a blessing to us and I want to say thank you. But as we're heading into this next year, next Sunday will be the first of the year Sunday. And our congregation numbers have went up. Some of our Sunday school numbers have kind of went up. But now I have a new challenge for you this coming year. This is a challenge. If you're not attending a Sunday school, I challenge you to make a commitment to find one that you like and start attending. If you are attending a Sunday school, I challenge you to invite someone to come to Sunday school with you. Because Sunday school is a very vital part of our church. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time of studying God's Word and asking questions and trying to understand it better. Try a class. If you don't get anything out of it, try another one. If you don't get nothing out of that, try another one. If you don't get nothing out of all three, we'll figure out if we need to create a new one. But it's something in which is very vital in growing a healthy church. And I'm going to tell you, a healthy church is a church in which glorifies and honors God. And if you notice on the screen, you see that the sun's rising. And as the sun is rising, it is coming up. And as it's coming up, meaning a new day is approaching. A start to a whole fresh day. We're about to head into a whole new year. It's time to wipe this slate clean from the past. And it's time to focus on what is coming in the future. And are we doing what we need to be doing? It's not to do these things for numbers, but it's to do it for love and compassion for others, helping them to grow in their relationship with God and helping you. And the title of this message today is A Reason to Live. It's in Philippians chapter 1, and we got a few verses here. They're going to be our key verses. But as you turn there in your Bible, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray right now for the people in whom are not here today for whatever reason. And I just ask you, Father, that you'd lay your hand upon them and allow your will to be done, give them the comfort and the peace in which they need. Father, I pray for our church, I pray for this coming year, Lord, that you will find Calvary Baptist Church in Oxford, Mississippi to be faithful and true to you. The areas in where we're not faithful and where we're not true to you, Lord, I pray, Father, there would be true repentance. There would be things in which are changed that, Father, that line up with you and your word. I pray that no one would see or hear me, Father, but they'd see and hear you. I pray for wisdom, Lord, beyond measures, Lord, that you would show me the things in which you desire for me to do and how to lead, Father. But Father, as we study this word and we understand the reason why we need to live and not throw in the towel, we'll understand that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desires to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Now think about that. To be with Christ. Wow. Verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy and faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. As Paul was sitting in prison, this is some of the things in which he has wrote down. 
he had begun to contemplate what may be in store in his future. And he's thinking beyond where he's at right there. Because I'm going to tell you, he was in a bad situation. And we'll... He be, de- be delivered, or will he face execution? He was faced with those things right before him. He's called, he calls on the church to pray for him. And as he contemplates, as he thinks about his request for the church to be praying for him, his future, he's looking at and he's thinking, what is in the future? And he makes some statements there in those verses. His statement is confident that through the prayer and the help of the Spirit, he will be delivered from prison to continue the work in which the Lord has called him to do. Another thing he is noticing, he knows that he is in a win-win situation. If he is to live, that's great. If he is to die, that's even greater. You have to realize this man has been beaten. He was bruised. He was cut. He was sore. And he was in jail. Now I'm going to tell you, their jail isn't like our jail today. They didn't have cable TV. It was rough. It wasn't a place in where you wanted to go. But then he began to ponder which he would choose. To be with Christ in heaven or to stay here. And to me, this is a no-brainer. I'd say, it's been fun, guys, but beam me up, Scotty. Let's go. I would be wanting out of there. I would want to be with the Lord. And Paul didn't argue with being with the Lord was a, wasn't a bad choice. But he realized and he accepted that there was still work to be done here. He knew that more of the same was waiting for him on the other side of that prison wall. But Paul somehow found a reason to keep going. What about you? Are you so depressed and so down and so out about all the things that which are crashing in around you in your life that you're at the end of your rope and you're like, I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if I could have been like Paul. I believe I would have been, Lord, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to be with you now. I don't think I could have been looking past those prison walls in which were on the other side and tasks in which were for me to be accomplishing. Because I would have said, Lord, I was working on that and I got the stew beat out of me. And I wound up right here. But Paul started realizing the circumstances in which he was in, and he realized that he needed to keep going. And if we follow the example and find a reason to live, regardless of how tough life may be or may seem to be, do you got a reason to live? Do you have a reason to wake up in the morning and get up out of bed? Do you have a reason? To walk out of your door and do something. If your answer is no, say, Wes, I ain't got a reason to get up out of bed. I ain't got a reason to even walk out of my house. There's something wrong there. There's something in your heart, something in your life that is taking your eyes and your focus off the main thing. Because Paul realized what the main thing was, and that was glorifying Christ. Not glorifying himself, not glorifying nothing but Christ. And now, we'll get into the sermon. Our first point, he looked beyond himself. 
When you look there in verse 24, you'll see this. You'll see that Paul is starting to look beyond himself. He's starting to look beyond being in prison. He is looking beyond that. The turning point there in Paul's life, he had rather, he wanted to stay and go when it looked so bad. Beyond the current suffering he was doing. He saw all the new believers. He saw all the new churches that needed Him. He knew that there were things that He needed to do, not for Himself, but for the Lord. The turning point in your life will be when you start to look beyond yourself and your circumstances and see that there's people that need you. There was a dark time in my life when I was 15 years old that I didn't want to be here anymore. And I did everything I could to end it. I won't go into all the details and how it happened and how I'm still standing before you right now, but God wasn't through with me. I got news for you. If you're sitting in that pew right now, if you got air in your lungs, there's a reason you're here. And if you will look beyond the circumstances and the storms in which are in your life, if you will look beyond that, you'll realize there's people around you that need you. That people that need your help, that need your courage, that need your love. And you are not a prop in a story of life. You're not some kind of prop that's on the stage that as the life of story is playing out and you're just sitting there and you're really doing nothing. That is not what God created you for. You are a character with a role to play in the role of life. He gave every one of you and myself a script. And that script is to live every day for Him and not ourselves. We cannot settle for anything less. Our second point, He focused on God's plan. You'll see that there in verse 35. He knew it wasn't his choice when he was to live or when he was to die. That's God's timing. When we breathe our last, that's God's call, not ours. And Paul knew that. And he had some unfinished business. And until his mission was complete, he knew he would remain. See, At the very beginning of this, Paul was ready to go and be with the Lord. When you start reading this, Paul is like, here I come, Lord, I'm about to die. And the more he started talking to God about it and started looking at the things in which he started thinking beyond those prison walls. And he started thinking about those young Christians that are out there and how he could encourage them and help them grow in their faith. He started thinking about those churches that were growing and coming up. And he knew that God could use him in those situations to help them. Because Satan was going to do everything he could to stop it. And he knew the Lord could use him. He knew his mission wasn't over. And we are put here for a purpose. And we all have some unfinished business in which we need to take care of. Will you do it? Or are you just going to leave it unfinished? How do you know this? How do you know that we still have unfinished business? You're still here. When we're still here, We still have unfinished business to do. One 
one of the things in which someone shared with me one time many years ago. He talked about talking to people when they're laying there on their deathbed and he knows that they're about to die. He says, you need to go and you need to lean over in their ear and you grab their hand and squeeze their hand tight and say, is there something else you need to do for God before you breathe that last breath? And if they know there's nothing else in which they need to do for the Lord, it's just moments away that they're going to take their last breath. Because the moment in when we know we have completed the good work, we have ran the race in which the Lord has marked out for us, and then and only then is there our time to go. How are you running the race? How are you doing in the good work? How, much, how many projects are there around you that are unfinished? How many things around you, you know the Lord is wanting you to do, but you're saying later, when you need to be doing it today. And see, Paul was looking beyond his circumstances. No matter how old you are, as long as you have breath, God has work for you to do on this earth for His kingdom. The third point, You see here, he lived to see God glorified. See that in verse 26? It has nothing to do about himself. It all has to do with God. And it's right there in verse 26. He did what he did, not to bring glory to himself, but to bring glory to God. And to see the churches bring glory to God. He knew the wounds would heal. He knew the pain one day would stop. He knew there would be a moment the Lord would deliver him out of that jail cell. And he knew there was still work to be done for the glory of God. Paul didn't want to be delivered from prison so he would be out of a difficult situation. No, he didn't but so that the young church could see the power of their prayer. See, he had sent that letter to these churches, these young churches, and asked them to pray for him. And he knew the moment that he could walk through their doors, and they could turn around and see him walk through. He knew that they could say, our prayers have been answered. And he knew it would strengthen their faith and it would strengthen their zeal and passion for God. Paul knew that. It wasn't to glorify himself. It was to glorify God. And that he would be able to go and teach them in person. Not just write a letter or a note. But he could stand before them and proclaim the Word of God in which he had done in his life. If we live to bring glory to ourselves, we will always feel empty. We'll always feel incomplete if we're trying to live to bring glory to ourselves. But if we live to bring glory to God, our lives will be filled with joy, regardless of what our current circumstances may be. But if you want a life filled with joy, in peace, you're going to have to live for God, not yourself. Our fourth point, look at verse 26. He saw a future. He was able to see beyond the prison walls. He was beyond a time when he would be free and back doing the work of Christ. He could see where he needed to be. And he knew where he needed to be. Even if God chose not to deliver him and he to die in prison, he looked forward to eternity with Christ. But he knew that if he was to get out of there, there was a future. There was a ministry in which he needed to do. We all have 
a time. We all have a time in our life where we've been discouraged because current suffering or circumstances. And if you say you hadn't, you're probably telling a story. But should be able to have hope in the future when God brings it before us. You see, there are times that in the ministry, you look around and it looks dark. It looks dim and it looks bleak. But I have to say to myself, Lord, is there more work for me to do? And when I look around and know there's dying souls around me going to hell, I know my job's not finished. When I know there are people that are in need, I know my job's not finished. And I have to start looking beyond my circumstances and realize there's a future. And he even chose not to. We can look forward to a time where there's no more sorrow, no more pain. See, Paul was even looking into the future, and he looked and said, there is no future, I'm fixing to be with Christ. And he said, in that moment where I will be with Christ, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering. And Paul was looking for the future, and he was looking at the moment. And this morning, we too, like Paul, can contemplate our current situations and wonder what the future holds next year. What are the storms that are happening in your life? What are the obstacles that are going on in your life that it's hard for you to look past? What is it? Side note, there's tomorrow. There's a future. Realize that your circumstances, you will eventually get through them. And on the other side, as you go through them, the Lord is preparing you for something. What it is, I do not know. What it is that's in my life that when I go through trials and circumstances, all I can say is I know He's preparing me for something. And I have to realize that there's a future. And we, too, have a choice to make. Will we just tolerate life, bearing through tough things the best we can till Jesus comes back? Or we live for Him? Will we live in such a way that we're accomplishing the goals in which He has set before us? Or are we just going to sit back on a pew and wait for Jesus to return? You see, Paul didn't want to stay in that jail cell and say, well, I'm going to just wait for the Lord to take me on and be with Him. He said, no. There's work still to be done. When you look there in verse 20, verse 20 sums it all up like this. As it is my eager expectations and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Is He being honored today? Will He be honored next year in your body? whether living or by death. So my challenge to you for this year is in whatever you face, whatever you do, honor God. Honor God. Don't worry about the past. Don't worry about the things and all the bad stuff that's happened in the past. We can learn lessons from the past. We can't hit rewind in our life and go back there and honor God. 
I can stand before you right now and I name you time after time after time after time. I did not honor God with my life in the past. And you know what? I can't do nothing about it. All I can say is, God, forgive me for where I didn't honor you there. But the one thing I can do is say, God, I will honor you from here on. What are you going to do? Do you have a reason to live? For him. Let's pray. Father, you're an amazing God. Love you and praise you and honor you. And Father, there's a new year that is approaching us. Father, may we put the things and the obstacles of the past behind us. May we take the lessons in which we learned as we went through them and apply them to our life. And Father, may our future be glorified and honoring you. And Father, if there is someone here that they're empty, they have no reason to live, that today they would find the hope and the reason to live, and that is to glorify and honor you, not themselves but you. Father, I ask you to forgive us when we've fallen so short. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you to stand for our time of invitation and to be obedient in what God is asking you to do.